G'day Internet, Max Wright here and welcome to part four of the series, everything you need to know about Bitcoin for the newbies. Starting to get into the cool advanced stuff here, so a lot of people who are experienced with Bitcoin are also going to learn a lot. If you're new, please check out the playlist, which is the entire video series. It's the first link in the description. So right now we're going to talk about the second promise of Bitcoin, uh, which is a free, inclusive and instant worldwide payment network. Very, very important things to, to consider. Uh, in the previous video, we talked about its first promise, which was its store of value, okay? Did a deep dive there, highly recommend you check that out. Right now, we're gonna check out the second promise of Bitcoin, which is the payment network. So this is something that is really, really easy for us in the first world to take for granted. Um, we have bank accounts, we have credit cards, we have PayPal, we have Venmo, we have cash, we have payment networks coming out of our ears. There are so many different ways to transact with people. Um, but in the third world, this is an absolute game changer. There are 4 billion people living under totalitarian rule in this world, and around about the same number, 4 billion people who are unbanked. They have no access to um, bank accounts whatsoever. They don't have credit cards. They don't have Venmo, they don't have cash, they don't have any of it. There is, the only way they transact is in cash at the marketplace. They are completely locked out of all of the financial services here that we take for granted. There's another 1.3 billion people living in double or triple digits inflation, right? And that kind of ties more into the store of value thing from the, from the uh, last section. But there's just people desperately need a place to hide from inflation so to protect themselves from the ravishes of inflation, I should say, um, and a way to uh, enter the 21st century, the digital economy. How can they buy products online? Like, can you, I can't even imagine not being able to buy courses online. I buy a lot of courses online to teach myself certain things. And if I was in the third world, I, just, I couldn't buy a course online. I just, I just, we can't do it. It's crazy. They're missing out on all this incredible education. Okay, so... Something to point out, Bitcoin adoption has surged 880% just in the last year uh, for very, very good reasons. This payment network has really, really um, exploded this last year. So let's go back and understand this a, a little bit better. Um, as we saw in part one, I think it was part one or part two, the history of Bitcoin, uh, we found out that in 2017, through 2017 through 2020, this, this second promise, that of a payment network, it didn't really come to fruition. Um, it kind of got broken a little bit while they were building something called the Lightning Network. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So the payment network, the adoption by people using the, the payment network has really not taken place until just this last year. And then it has absolutely exploded. So this, um, let, let's, let's go through a little bit here. So we, the, let's go through the three words I use to describe the payment network that Bitcoin promises to be. It promises to be inclusive. It's very, very important to understand. There is no KYC, there is no AML. That's know your customer, anti-money laundering things. You don't, have to, you, know, there's no, you don't have to sign up. There's anybody with a computer, a phone, an iPad. You just get your hands on any electrical device and you, can, you have access to a bank in your pocket. You have access to not just banking facilities, superior banking facilities. You have ways to pay anybody anywhere in the world instantly for free. Very, very powerful stuff. And it's just, it just brings such an enormous amount of efficiency to billions upon billions of people. And we, we, we are seeing, just like um, if, you, if you're aware that um, India, for example, it never really had dial-up internet. It just skipped straight over it. Um, they, by the time dial-up internet was about ready to launch in India, um, they had cell phones and they just did broadband. So they just went straight to it. So they just, they never did a dial up. They just skipped straight over it and went straight to broadband because the, the West, the first world was developing so fast. By the time they were ready to implement our hand-me-downs of uh, dial up, they just went straight to, and they skipped this whole thing. So the entire, the, the developing world, in my opinion, is just going to skip over the entire banking system that we all know and use in the first world. They're just gonna go straight to Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. And that's what, I mean, it's what it means for the world's efficiency, what it means for lifting billions of people out of poverty. It is a mind blowing thought. It is really, really powerful. So what's next here? So emerging markets are leading the way. And this is really important to understand where Bitcoin has a divide. 
In the first world, I don't need payment networks. I've got them coming out of my ears. And I value my Bitcoin like pr they're precious to me. I don't want to spend them. It, I, I don't want to spend them. So I don't, it doesn't matter if Starbucks or Walmart starts accepting Bitcoin. For me, for me, it doesn't matter. Some other people here in this country, it absolutely does matter to them. And it's a good thing. I want to see it more readily available. But to be honest, I don't care. The first promise, the store of value, is all that I care about from me. For me, Gresham's law apply. Gresham's law is good money chases out bad. Sorry, bad money chases out good. The fiat money is the bad money. And I want to get that out of my hands as fast as possible. Here, I'll, I'll pay for everything with my fiat currency. I'll use a credit card. I'll even get rewards. All right? My Bitcoin, that's my good money. I don't want to spend that. All right? In the emerging markets, it's an, the absolute opposite of truth. They are craving a payments rail. They're craving a bank account. They are craving a store of value. They need all of this stuff to just get them into the, t the 21st century. And so what we're seeing is that in the developing world, the, uh, the payment network is really leading the way um, in terms of peer to peer. So in the first world, the vast majority of Bitcoin transaction is you wire money to a big company like a Kraken or a Coinbase or something like that. You wire the money, you buy your Bitcoin, you take your Bitcoin, you stick it in storage and it's just like putting gold in your safe or something like that. You just now hold Bitcoin as a place to store your value and it's going up really, really quickly. So it's a great investment. That's what happens in the first world. In the, in the developing world, they need it to transact. So what they're doing is they, they, don't, they, don't, they don't have the bank accounts to tie in to Kraken and Coinbase. They do peer-to-peer -peer transactions. There might be like one person in the whole village who travels four hours by bus to go and you know, use to, to somehow get some Bitcoin from someone in the city and maybe he's the only guy in the village with a bank account, something like that. And he gets the Bitcoin. He comes back to the village and he now does peer-to-peer -peer trade. The people in the village come up and hand him a few bits of paper or give him some, uh, give him some whatever, bananas, whatever. And there he's handing out Bitcoin. It's a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. In Africa, peer-to-peer -peer exchange is even bigger than peer-to-peer um, -peer exchange here in the United States. And so we're seeing an interesting world where in the developing world, you're getting this bottom-up approach. It's the people who are unbanked, the people who are hungry, are craving first world banking features. They're just scooping it up. Almost every week, there's stories of you know, people, villages being rescued in Cuba, in Vietnam, in Nigeria, all just like all of a sudden the economy had ground to a halt. The, the currency was in hyperinflation or high inflation. They couldn't get their hands on any useful money. And all of a sudden, you know, one little one person in the village has a family member somewhere and they send $500 worth of Bitcoin to this person in the village. And all of a sudden, Bitcoin starts circulating around this village and this, the, the economy within this village just kind of takes off. So this is happening right now at an absolutely incredible rate because, again, I don't want to repeat myself from the um, history of Bitcoin video, but the payment rail network was a little bit of a letdown the last few years while they were building. It was, it was while they were building Lightning Network. So let's get into Lightning Network and understanding what that is. I should mention Vietnam, Nigeria, Argentina, Venezuela, the list goes on of emerging markets like rapidly, rapidly growing here with Bitcoin. So I think it's time to introduce the Lightning Network. And here, let me see what we got. Sorry, I got something here in my eyes. So Lightning Network is Bitcoin's scaling solution. Here's a really interesting concept. Bitcoin is kind of uh, very, very, it's very simple, which is a very, very good thing. And I liken it to the internet. The internet was a very, very simple concept. It's a TCP IP protocol, and we're gonna allow packets of information to go back and forth between computers. That's all it is, that's all it does, that's the internet. But then people come along with layer two solutions. And now they'll build email on top of that. They'll build websites on top of that. They'll build search engines on top of that. They'll build social media on top of that. And it's the layers two, three, four solutions that really give power to this incredible invention called the internet. Bitcoin, I think, is very, very much like that. It has an enormous amount of power just in and of itself, much more so than TCP IP had. But at its core, it is relatively simple. So what's happening on top of that is layer two solutions. And we are now at that point in the development where the layer two solutions are really coming through thick and fast in a lot of different ways. And we'll get to those in just a second. But I think the most important one is the Lightning Network. Now the Lightning Network is, makes Bitcoin as a utility function absolutely on crack. 
The, um, it is even better than the Bitcoin Core Protocol. It is faster, it is cheaper, it is free, absolutely free. It doesn't cost a, a anything whatsoever to send any amount of money. That includes micro pennies, for example. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it, yeah, so it's free and it's instant and it's worldwide. So it is, oh, and it scales at, I think, I think it's several orders of magnitude higher than MasterCard and Visa combined. Right? So the, light, the Bitcoin Lightning Network can handle pretty much every single transaction on the planet. That's how powerful the Lightning Network is. It is the Bitcoin scaling solution. It's instant, universal, and free. Its capacity is orders of magnitude larger than Visa and MasterCard. And here you can see, again, 2017 to 2020, the Lightning Network was still being developed. Here we see, since this, this graph only goes back to January 21. And what I might do is I might move my mug over here, just in case you wanted to see some things over there. Um, and you can see the scaling solution here. Uh, it is just going absolutely vertical. It is growing so fast. Every single, every single leap up takes less days and less days and less days. And money, Bitcoin, is pouring into the Lightning Network. And again, we in the first world are like, eh, whatever. For the, for the developing world, it is just, it is so valuable to them. And I just expect this to absolutely explode over the next few years. So what does it allow? What kind of problems does it solve, right? So again, we're gonna put our investor hat on or even our entrepreneur hat if we invest in a business or start in a business. What, what problem are we solving and for how many people are we solving it? Let's understand that, let's, let's take a look at one small little niche, right? So we've already talked about the fact that there's billions of people who just don't have access to banking and all of the things that can, that can mean. So let's look at one little tiny thing of what that means. The remittance business uh, is a multi, multi-billion dollar business. I think um, El Salvador, for example, I think 25% of their GDP is remittance. If you don't know what remittance is, remittance is maybe you have friends or family living in the first world, they make money and they send money back to the people who they haven't, you know, who are still living in the old country, right? In this case, it was in El Salvador. So 25% of El Salvador's GDP is by people living outside of El Salvador sending money back to family and loved ones. Okay, that's what remittance is. Here's how remittance has worked until Bitcoin was invented. You used to have to go to Western Union. Someone here, let's say America, would go and earn money. They would go down to Western Union. It's a nice clean office. That's what you probably think of it is. And it's pretty safe. You're in America. You give them some money and Western Union sends the money. And then the, then the person at the other end can go and pick up the money that the family member sent. They've got to go to a Western Union office. First of all, in those countries, very often, it's like a two, three, four hour bus ride to get to a city to find a Western Union office. And then when you get there, there's gangs all around there knowing that people walk in there and walk out with money, The people are getting robbed left and right, right? So you travel for hours to get there. And then when you're in there, because it's so expensive to manage all of the security and all of the issues in that country, some, the Western Union fees take between eight and 30%. These remittances are very often $100, $200. It's, it's the guy cleaning, um, you know, mowing your lawns. It's the, guy, uh, it's the guy or gal just doing these simple labor tasks. They've just left El Salvador. They might not even speak the language. They make a little bit of money and they wanna send back some to their, their, their wife or their kids or their mom or their dad or whatever. They send back about $100. Western Union takes $30. I don't say takes like they're mean. That's, that's the cost of doing business in those countries. It's extremely expensive. Western Union takes 30 bucks from that $100, right? Only $70 gets to the, its recipient. Then the recipient leaves the Western Union office and they're 50-50 at getting robbed at gunpoint by a gang. Then they got to get back on the bus, go for two, three hours back to the village, maybe with some money, maybe not. This is how the remittance industry, the world over, has worked for decades and decades and decades. Now with Bitcoin, what happens is the worker here in the US, he has an account here with a, an app. Let's say he uses the InStrike app. It has his credit card hooked in or maybe he uh, maybe just uh, has a bank account connected to it, whatever he does. He connects to the Bitcoin app and boom, he buys Bitcoin instantly and free without, losing it, without leaving his home. He then sends it via the Lightning Network to his friend, uh, to their cell phone in El Salvador, to their loved one, instant and free. The person in El Salvador now gets it. They never had to leave their house. They didn't have to catch any buses. They were right there in the house and they have 
Bitcoin. Now the next step here is in the relatively immature uh, uh, world, it's an immature Bitcoin world, he may have to convert this back into local currency in order to spend it. But maybe he chooses to offer a service and be that service for everyone in the village. Hey, you know, once a week I'll go, I'll go to the city and I'll go to the bank and I'll pull the money back and then I can be, the, the, I can be a broker for everybody in there. But that is short-term thinking. And what really is going to happen, it's going to happen very, very fast, I believe, is that there's more and more people do it in the village. The merchants, the people with the food cart, the people at the grocery store, they're just going to accept the Bitcoin as payment right there in their wallet. Remember, what are they going to do? They're living in a place with double, triple-digit inflation. Don't When they get it, aren't they going to convert it straight back into Bitcoin anyway? If they're smart, they would. They, maybe they don't have the knowledge and education to do it yet, but that knowledge and education is filtering into these emerging markets at an exponential rate. And what you'll find is that you'll find, I'm thoroughly convinced, that although we use it in the first world just as a store of value, what we'll see in the third world, their use to their currency is collapsing every, every five to 10 years. They're used to wildly volatile um, uh, currency. A currency that's volatile going up they're going to cling to it like with both fists and the merchants are going to accept it and the people when you send in a remittance they're not going to try and change it back into the local garbage currency that's you know running through triple digit inflation they're just going to keep it and they're going to spend it right there at the store they're going to spend in bitcoin the the merchant the the store owner they're going to leave it in bitcoin to one day they're going to sell spell uh, um, sell it but if pretty soon the entire economy is just going to be bitcoin everyone's going to have it everyone's going to use it and that's going to be the currency of that particular village and village by village all around the world that is what's going to happen and it's probably worth while sharing the fact that this is already happening um, there's, a, there's a great documentary made uh, about this concept and, and a gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Jack Moller um, he created a, an app called you know, I think it's called strike I think I believe it's called strike um, and it was specifically designed to service these exact people. And he actually went down and lived in a village. He went and found a place, he nicknamed it Bitcoin Beach. And he went around educating people all over this particular little village about how Bitcoin works. He offered to broker for people, he trained people how to do it. And now that village just operates on Bitcoin. It was so successful, it was a village in El Salvador, it was so successful and it got so much media that the president of El Salvador got wind of it and took notice. And he realized how much it could help his people. And in an unbelievable twist, I thought we were about five years away, maybe 10 years away from this happening. In an unbelievable twist, the, the president and the Congress of, Mexico, uh, of El Salvador, they have passed a law that Bitcoin is now legal tender in El Salvador. They have mandated, not a big fan of this part, but they have mandated that every single store owner in the country has to accept Bitcoin as payment. I can't believe this. I really thought we were about five to 10 years away from it, but Bitcoin is just going into an absolute hockey stick moment uh, where the, every single graph I look at is like this graph. It is going off the charts. And I think it represents, I know people think about, oh my God, I wish I bought Bitcoin when it was pennies. I must be late now, now that Bitcoin's $50,000 per Bitcoin. And I'm telling you now, I believe we are still very, very, very early. And we're gonna cover this more. We're gonna get into the investment thesis of Bitcoin in the next video. We're gonna talk about what is the adoption curve? Who is adopting Bitcoin? I've just mentioned the countries, but I'll go through all the different sectors that we wanna keep your eyes on. Because Bitcoin isn't just like taking over one little niche here. It's literally taking over dozens of niches in dozens of directions in dozens of uh, countries. And just it's just, it's an animal that is just going all over the world. And you are so early. And we're gonna understand just how early you are in coming across Bitcoin and thinking about whether or not you're gonna invest in it right here in the next video. So make sure you're here tomorrow, Central Time, 10 a.m. Subscribe to the channel and uh, go ahead, click the like button right now. Please share this video, help me get it out. And if you haven't watched it, Go and look at the first link in the description. That's the entire playlist and you'll get yourself all caught up to where we are so far in this video series. So thank you so much and I will see you guys tomorrow. Take care. Bye.